And this is a top, tonight's topic is one that I'm really excited about. I'm really excited to have Graham here. Um, but first, some introductions. I already introduced myself. Oh, yes. I am sitting here talking to you from Fort Lee, New Jersey, um, just across the George Washington Bridge from Manhattan. So um, just take a few seconds, introduce yourself, what sport you play, what, where you are in the world, and maybe one sentence about anything else you'd like. All right, so first I am going to hand it, I'm gonna um, ask Doug Lynch to speak first. Hi, everybody. Uh, excited to be a part of the group chat today. Thanks, Lou, for pulling this together. Uh, my name is Doug. I'm from Vancouver, BC, Canada. I played professional ice hockey for 14 years, uh, and I retired a few years ago, and I started an eco-performance, um, eco-friendly performance brand called Zenkai Sports. So, hi, everybody. Awesome. And now I'm going to ask Ridian. G'day, I'm Ridian. I do uh, athletics or track and field if you're from North America, uh, specifically race walking. Uh, I'm calling in from Melbourne, Australia. And something interesting, I guess, is that, um, yeah, last month, uh, Shay, who's also on the chat, and I did uh, some carbon liter literacy training um, facilitated by the uh, Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games Organising Committee. And yeah, that was really, uh, it was really good. Um, yeah, I guess a bit of training to, to go through and sort of thread, thread some things together. And uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about it, um, feel free to, to shoot me or I guess shoot uh, Lou a, a message and uh, we can uh, connect you up. Uh, thanks so much, Ridian. And Ridian um, all, uh, was a little uh, modest. He is a, a two-time Olympian in race walking and also recently uh, in the World Championships, uh, tra track and field world championships in Eugene and the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, England. So um, now, since he mentioned, mentioned Shay, Shay, we're going back north of the border to, uh, to Canada. Shay, you're up. Evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Shay Smith. I was an Olympian in track and field and bobsledding. Uh, I live in Ottawa, which is Canada's capital on the East Coast, uh, I know, 10 hours from New York City. Uh, something interesting, um, next week, myself and some other Olympians and uh, university folks are hosting the second annual Green Sports Day in Canada, kind of running off the coattails the coat of uh, the U.S. version and the Australian version. So looking forward to uh, chatting about that. We've invited Doug, who's on the call, to be a panelist. Um, so feel free to uh, tune in if uh, anybody's interested in that. I'm interested in writing about it after the fact for Green Sports Blog. So uh, we'll talk offline about that. Um, Inya, you're up. Hi, everyone. I'm Inya. I'm from Slovenia. I play golf at North Carolina State University in the US and I'm just very interested in sustainability overall. And that's why I'm a part of Eco Athletes. And I will also say Inya has been a great uh, champion low these uh, last several months as she's brought uh, energy and ideas to the fore. And um, uh, like many of you, um, this is, I am so inspired by all of you. Let's just say that. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to, hmm, I'm going to go to Cam. Hi, I'm Cam. Um, I am a third year at the University of Virginia, and I am a member of the women's rowing team. I am the Green Athletics intern um, for our Office of Sustainability, and I run the Green Athletics group within the athletic department. Um, I'm excited to be here and super grateful to be a part of this community. Awesome. And now I'm going to introduce for her first time as an Eco Athletes champion. We have two brand new champions. I'm going to go with Catherine LeBeuf. Did yes. I pronounce that correct? Yeah, correct? not bad. Not bad. All right. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm good here. at pronouncing Catherine. <laughs> yeah, so I'm new here, but I'm originally from the East Coast of Canada. I played ice hockey at Brown University, where I also earned my engineering degree. And I found my way to Houston in the energy industry. I work with a startup company where we have this industrial 
uh, control valve technology that reduces methane emissions from operations from our oil and gas. So, yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Super <Catherine>. excited. <laughs> yes, and and Catherine is a, exists at the intersection of many different important vectors in this space. Also new is Caitlin Bertola, and I am excited because Caitlin just became a champion today. I'm also excited because she is the first champion and not the last from my alma mater, Rutgers University in yes. New Brunswick, New Jersey. So I'm going to do it one time, Caitlin, R. You. All right. Um, so my name's Caitlin. I'm a senior on the gymnastics team here at Rutgers, and I am brand new to Eco Athletes, and I'm so excited to be a part of this. So it's so great to meet you all. Fantastic. Um, and now we, uh, I believe we have Justice Bartley. Justice, are you there? I am here. It's I'm, good I'm, to I'm see you, buddy. Or I can't see you, but it's good to hear you. Yeah, right now I'm just sitting in some traffic, <laughs> so All right. uh, I wish I could be online uh, and see you guys, but um, yeah, I'm finally able to get some time to, to get on here, so I'm really excited to to be here, um, and a little bit about myself, I, um, right now I'm helping out the Lakers, I'm like one of the video coordinators and player development coaches um, for the, the Lakers here in Los Angeles, um, and I'm also a UVA alum, so Go who's. Um, that's great. But um, yeah, excited to be here as well. Yes, we have a strong UVA presence, let's just say, both <laughs> uh, in, in our currently at UVA and among alums. And, and uh, so Justice played hoops for uh, UVA. And so now I am, uh, I'm, well, first of all, thank you all for, for coming. I'm now going to hand it over to Graham first before you get into your presentation. First, welcome, and then maybe a brief introduction of yourself. Yeah, um, hey everybody, my name is Graham Zimmerman. I live in Bend, Oregon, and uh, in the United States. I'm actually originally from New Zealand, not that you would know from my accent, but I've spent a lot of time living down there. And, um, and I work as a professional mountain climbing athlete. I've done that for about 15 years now, and it's really been a wonderful, wonderful journey that's taken me a lot of cool places. And that's some part of what we'll talk about today. And then these days I work for an organization called Protect Our Winners um, in working in climate advocacy. So actually very, very similar to, to what y'all are doing here. And, um, and in that role, I primarily work as basically a coach for folks who want to get into climate advocacy. And those are primarily athletes who I work with who are in the outdoor rec space. So pro skiers, pro snowboarders, um, trail runners, mountain bikers, and um, I feel like there's one other trail. Climbers. Trail. Climbers, yeah, me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, leaving myself out of the equation, classic. Um, so yeah, so uh, I'm, I, what I'm gonna do today is share some kind of storytelling about what I love to do and kind of what's drawn me into the mountains and what gets me fired up and um, and then, uh, and then we're going to talk about advocacy, advocacy um, particularly around climate. And I'm going to kind of talk about storytelling and what a powerful tool it is for for driving change in the world around us. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Should so, Lucia, just dive in. Yeah. Uh, let's dive in, and then and and uh, uh, Eagle Athlete Champions. There will be a time afterwards for uh, conversation and discussion and questions. Oh yeah, and I'm I'm here for whatever questions you have, whether around. You know, policy or around science or around you know kind of how we can do this work you know from the position where we're in uh so i think i'll go ahead and share my screen here i've got a bunch of slides for you here we go can everybody see that all right i should say imperfect advocacy perfect you got that perfect. heck yep. yeah all right yep. so here we go imperfect advocacy with graham zimmerman that's me um, so we're, I'm going to start talking about the thread that has drawn me into this space. So I think it's really important to start um, any conversation about mountain climbing or being a climbing athlete with kind of a sort of centering point of, that I am like, climbing is not everything that I do. I am, I'm a community member out here in Bend, Oregon. This is my wife, Shannon. This is our ridiculous dog, Pebble. Um, and, you know, we do, we do a lot of 
pretty pretty normal things out here in Bend, which is which is a lot of fun. But the thing that has really filled my cup over the last really 20 years has been heading into remote parts of the big mountains of the world to attempt things that have never been done before. And in terms of kind of modern alpinism, um, what that looks like is taking the skill sets that we learn while going ice climbing, this on the left is up in Canada, um, climbing frozen waterfalls, going rock climbing here on the right, this is the Smith Rock State Park in Oregon. And we take these skill sets and we apply them to big rowdy mountains in the big mountains of the world. This is um, this was an unclimbed peak in the Pakistani Karakoram, peak of Linksar. And, uh, and this, it's, it's just been this really amazing journey where we get to go to these huge mountain features and we get to go and utilize these skill sets to climb them and spend time on some really incredible terrain. Um, you can kind of see here, here we are like climbing snow and ice and rock in the mountains and and it's been this really, this really amazing journey that's, you know, not only has it been pretty badass in terms of like being able to do some really cool things, but it's, it's really, these are, these are gigantic spaces that make you feel really small, um, which is really powerful. You know, sometimes, sometimes in, you know, we're kind of working as athletes and things, you kind of like feel like you are, you know, like you kind of like your ego can expand and you can get kind of like pretty excited about what we were doing in the mountains have consistently kind of taken me back and put me back to, you know, just, I'm just a little human in a huge world. And there is space where I've been able to really um, reflect on everything else that's going on in my life. Um, you know, unlike when I'm closer to home and it's, you know, my life is kind of full of push notifications and emails and work and projects and different, like, different PR opportunities and different, you know, all the different things we have to deal with. It's when I go to the mountains, these expeditions will oftentimes take two to three months and I just get to check out. And I utilize that time to really try to be strategic with, you know, what I'm thinking about and what I'm spending time on and both while I'm in the mountains, but also when I get home, which has been a really powerful tool. And then I'm sure a lot of you have experienced the, the, the joy that comes from you know, the, the folks that you spend time with when you're doing these things. Um, the partnerships that I've gained from mountain climbing have, have really honestly been some of the most powerful and beautiful and fun and lasting components of everything, of, of all this climbing that I've done. These are three guys. This is up at like 22,000 feet on an unclimbed peak in Pakistan and a storm had come in and we just had to dig a hole and sit there for a while. And, um, it was great. You know, I just got to like sit in a hole with my friends at 22,000 feet for a few hours. It's lovely. <laughs> and chasing, chasing down these big mountains has been something that, that I've, you know, I've seen a lot of success with. I've like won the gold medal of Alpine climbing. I've won the national kind of best of in the United States for Alpine climbing. One of, I guess, kind of a bevy of other awards and things like that. Um, you know, I've been successful as an athlete in, in many different ways, but it really mostly comes back to these amazing spaces that I get to spend time in and the things that they teach me and the relationships that I form within them. And it's been a really, really powerful thing. And so I've spent the last, you know, 15, 20 years in the mountains. And I have, I have you know, I frequently go back to the same places kind of over and over again to try projects or try something that I saw in the last expedition. And as you, as you might expect, we've seen a lot of change up there. And this has been something for me that has really driven a lot of questions. Um, it's driven a lot of kind of concerns about what, you know, what my impacts on the world around me are. And it's something that, that, you know, spending a lot of time in the high altitude, high latitude parts of the planet has just been really obvious. Um, these, these photos are from up in Canada. This is uh, mostly in the Rockies and then over kind of near Rogers Pass. So I guess that's the Silkirks. And, um, and the first photo was taken um, about 100 years ago. And then the, the uh, second photo was taken in the last 10 years. And you can just see how much these glaciers are receding. This is, if anybody's been up to the Icefields Parkway, this is like the Columbia, Columbia, um, I guess the Columbia Icefield. And it's like these, you know, these features are fully going away. It's a very dramatic 
demonstration of climate change. And funnily enough, um, in terms of education, I actually studied glacial hydrology in school um, back when I was, you know, 19 and 20. And so I've always known what was going on up in these parts of the world. It's never been a question of like, is climate change real? Is it, you know, is it us? It's always been something I've known. It's just been something I didn't really know what to do about. But as, you know, as I have spent more and more time in the mountains, it's become something that I've become aware that I need to do something about. I need to utilize, you know, any platform that I have, any leverage that I have to try to drive change. And, um, and it's been something that's traditionally been, you know, primarily just present in the high latitude, high altitude parts of the world, like I mentioned, but we've been talking for years about how, oh, this is going to show up closer to home. You know, this is something that will will affect us at home sooner rather than later. And, and I think that, that that conversation has really changed over the last five years. This is in Bend a couple of years ago um, and when you know the wildfire smoke was raging through. And this now happens every year. And, um, it's, and it's you know hazardous for folks' health. It's really challenging for my training. Um, it means you, know, you can see a little pebble here on the left who you met earlier, can't go for a dog walk, and she is pissed. Um, but I think, you know, it's like, this is a really interesting kind of inflection point to think about like who this is now affecting. It's no longer just affecting my ability to go climbing. Um, you know, for folks who don't live in a well-sealed home with AC, um, who maybe are houseless or need to work outside in order to make their living wage, this is a major health hazard. This is something that is affecting our local economy in terms of tourism. So it's, it's you know, it's like really having a dramatic impact on both public health and economy. And it's something that's becoming, you know, a bigger and bigger problem. And then as we go back to the mountains, um, it is becoming really dangerous up there. This is from last year, I went and tried a new route on a peak called K2, which is the second highest peak in the planet. And we went and we were like, we were, we, we had everything in our favor. We were super fit. Um, we had a really strong team. We were climbing really well. We were climbing in this like modern ultralight style. And, um, and the weather was great, but in fact, the weather was too good. It got really hot and we ended up going from like, oh my God, we're going to do this thing to, we have to get out of here now because this mountain is collapsing around us. And, uh, this is, this is, uh, this little shot is taken from a, a perch. We kind of ended up like we're on this big wall and, and there's like this little thing sticking out. So we were like sitting on that way and the whole mountain was just collapsing around us. And we were, we just had to sit there and wait for it to get dark. So it'd be a little cooler and then just start repelling as quickly as we could. And, uh, and so this is, you know, it's something that it's something that's affecting all of us. And the next thing that we're going to talk about is how, like, like, basically what that means for all of us. And for those of us, particularly like all of you who are athletes and have a platform to utilize to speak out on, and how each of you have stories that, you know, of how this climate change is affecting your families, it is affecting your livelihood, it's affecting your sports, and how we can leverage those in order to drive change around, around climate. So that brings us to speaking up. Um, so my kind of start into this world of political um, advocacy came in about 2015. And I was, I was at a film festival, we had just launched a movie and we were there presenting it. And, and, um, and I was like, I don't know, sitting, sitting there drinking a cocktail, talking to somebody. And, and I found there was somebody from Protect Our Winners who was there and um, a woman who was one of the executives at that point. And I ended up chatting with her and she's like telling me about what she does. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, I wish I could do that kind of work. And, and, but I fly way too much. I'm on airplanes way too much. I drive too much. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. You need to do this work. It doesn't matter how much you fly. We're going to get you in here. And it, that really turned into my kind of entry point into what, into advocacy. And I think a really important kind of place to start here as we talk about this is advocacy and activism are two words that we use interchangeably a lot of the time. And, um, and I think they're, for folks like us, they're really, they're really important words to understand. So generally speaking, when we talk about advocacy, we are talk about, talking about operating from the inside of an organization or group versus activism is like yelling and screaming from the outside. So if we're talking about going and marching on DC, um, that's activism. Um, but if we're talking about operating 
within systems that we are part of to drive change, that is advocacy. And both are important, both are valuable. Um, I think, in my opinion, you can get more work done in advocacy because you're already entrenched in those systems. And for each of you, hearing you describe the sports that you're participating in, um, you, are, you are deep in systems that, you know, that are being affected by climate, where you're communicating with groups of people who are also participating in this sport. Um, and, it's, it's, and these are really powerful places from which we can drive change. And so while activism is super important, it's something to engage with, and there's every reason to go march and do all that kind of work and encourage more people to do so. I think if each of you, when we talk about the kind of the superpower that you have in this space, like you have the power to be really um, effective advocates in the, in the communities and in the organizations in which you work. And so that's something that, that I like personally ended up exploring. Um, I, you know, I continued climbing. Um, I, I continued going on expeditions. I did, I did do some focus on climbing more at home. Um, I did some focus on kind of understanding what I eat and how much I drive and what kind of car I'm driving and things like that. But I focused mostly on policy and going, going to DC and speaking up, working, working in halls of Congress to go and spend time with senators and representatives, as well as um, some of the kind of admin, like folks who work for the DOI and DOJ and DOD. Sorry, I'm using acronyms. I shouldn't do that. Uh, Department of primarily Department of Energy, Department of Interior, and Department of Defense, and working with the, those folks on like how they're spending money and where they're spending money and where they're finding solutions and how we can support that work. Um, and then, of course, lobbying with folks like this is me talking to, um, let's see, this is uh, uh, Greg Walden, who was my representative at the time. Um, and, and I was able to go in there and share with him about what I'm seeing, how this is affecting our economy, and how it's affecting what we're doing. And um, and that and we've really proven out that that works. And so the thing that I really want to dig into a little bit right now is this concept at the bottom right of imperfect advocacy. And I think that something that I run into all the time while I am coaching um, other athletes on kind of like how to be a climate advocate is that they feel like they can't do it because oh I fly you know oh I drive oh I you know, you know, I do all this stuff to go participate in this sport that is the, you know, it is the passion of my life. It's also how I make money. It's like, it's, you know, it's all these things. So how can I, how can I be an advocate and do that stuff? And it seems like there's this perceived hypocrisy that's really hard to get around. And I think that, I think that as we look at, you know, the two kind of like primary pathways that we have for solving climate, we can separate them into personal change and systemic change. And personal change is a thing that we oftentimes over-index on super heavily. And the reasons that we do that are in many ways because we have been told that is the way that we create change. And a lot of that is actually even driven by the fossil fuel industry. Um, the carbon calculator was invented by Exxon back in like this, back in the 80s or 90s. Um, and there's been this whole narrative that's been driven that like, hey, you just like, we can fix climate. Like, you just got to like, stop driving so much and we'll do this. Um, but when it comes down to it, 70% of carbon emissions come from industry. I think it's actually 70% comes from like the top 100 companies. It's like some banana statistic like that. And um, and so if we look at like, you know, the, the biggest chunk of the pie that we need to deal with, it's not personal change, it is, it is industry and we drive industrial change through systemic change. And then there's this other, this other really important component when we're looking at what it takes to drive personal change. When you look at like the solutions that are presented to us for driving personal change, it's, you know, it's buy, like make your house more energy efficient. It is putting in solar panels, putting in a battery, buying in an EV, um, you know, buying the more expensive detergent. And what is the thing that all of those items require? It is capital investment. It is having money. And it means that the concept of personal change is something that it requires a lot of privilege. It requires excess income. It is not an option for the, you know, for the millions of Americans that are living near the poverty line, not to mention like global citizens living near the poverty line. And when we look at driving systemic change 
And we look at like in what sorry what systemic change means is instead of you know us driving less, it means decarbonizing our grid, like making it so that the ways that we're getting that we're generating power are renewable and are green. Um, it means um, setting ourselves up so that you know when like if you're going to buy a car, it is you know it's going to be an EV. You don't have a choice to like spend more money on an EV or get this like cheap combustible uh, combustion engine uh, car. It's like, no, no, like your option is to buy an EV. That's, and we have the infrastructure in place to run those. And it's, you know, and it's working on things like housing standards so that like when houses are built or when houses are sold, they're highly indexed on how energy efficient they are so that, you know, when we're, when we're building these homes, even, even homes that are not like, you know, really nice LEED certified buildings, um, that they are more efficient. And, um, and so that we're decarbonizing all these parts of the system in which we live so that we can all kind of decarbonize together alongside our industry. And as we look at what that means, like kind of how to like think about that, um, it's, it turns into a narrative shift. We are stuck in this narrative of like, in order to solve climate, Lou, I need you to stop driving. I need you to stop heating your home. I need you to stop buying blueberries from Argentina. I need you to sit at home without the heat on, not go anywhere and like live off of carrots in your backyard. And that's like, that's like totally unacceptable. That's like, like nobody's going to do that. And what if we flip that narrative so that we say we are imperfect advocates. Everybody in the current system is imperfect. So imperfect advocacy is actually the only solution that we have to work with. And what if we pivot that narrative so that we say, I want to go climbing in the Canadian Rockies and I want to be able to drive my EV from my home in central Oregon to go and go be able to recharge at a variety of stations as I drive up to Canada. And I want to be able to drive home and have that whole trip be carbon neutral or much more carbon efficient. And what if we decarbonize air travel so that, you know, I can go and I can go to Pakistan and have that take place on a like hydrogen power, powered plane that is not doesn't have carbon emissions and be able to do these things all, like have everybody take on a decarbonized lifestyle together and be able to continue to pursue all these things that fill our cup and give us access to the really rich global culture that we currently have as well as global economy and all this stuff and that's like that seems, that seems to me like the kind of world we want to live in. And that, for me, is what imperfect advocacy is all about. And so as we talk about, like, what, you know, okay, so, like, okay, we want to talk about imperfect advocacy. Um, and if you want to pick that apart later during the Q&A in just a minute, that's fine. Um, but, um, but what tools do we have to drive that change? Um, like, what do we have so that we can make that the kind of world that we want to live in. And so this is going back to the beginning of the presentation where I told you a story about how I fell in love with the mountains. And subsequently I discovered through my love of the mountains that climate change was a problem and that I needed to do something about it. And I've taken action on that. That story of how climate is affecting what I love is a story that I suspect that each of you have. And something that you can you can pull together as a narrative that you can utilize to share and create common ground with a broad community so that you can subsequently share how, you know, if we look towards systemic change, we can decarbonize together. We can uh, we can move towards, you know, more social equity around that and around like how we power our things and how we look at carbon. And we can also, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of economic progress and jobs and energy security that comes along with that. But that all, all, like that conversation can all start with stories that each of you have. And so as you think about, you know, this work that you're taking on, I, I really encourage you to kind of look at your personal story and think about how has climate change affected me? How has it has affected my community, my family? And how can I leverage that story in order to create conversations that we can utilize to drive systemic change in the world around us. And that's, and that's really, that's really mostly what I have for you today is, is that kind of message of like, you, you have superpowers when it comes to getting this work done. And it's not a matter of like turning yourself into somebody 
who you are currently are not. It's all just about like looking at the stories that you're telling and understanding how climate builds into them and then subsequently how you can leverage them. And I think through that model, each of you can really drive change in the world around you. And that's what I'd like to encourage you to do. Um, and there's Pal, that's what I work with. So that's that's the presentation I've got for you. Um, drop out of uh, share screen mode here so we can all look at each other because I wanna make sure that I'm here for any questions you have or thoughts or anything. And, and also say that if any of you are kind of like, oh shit, I need to do some like strategic storytelling. Like, how do I do that? I'm, I, I'm happy to make myself available for chatting, you know, kind of outside of this conversation. Lou's got my info. I'm pretty easy to get in touch with. I just mostly sit around and I'm either like climbing or talking about climate at any, any given time. So I'm happy to <laughs> chat with you all about it. So what's, what's bubbling up? What do you want to know? I have a question. So, so far I noticed that if you present things to people in the way that they will resemble to it, how could you make your story important to others? Sorry, what, what was the beginning of what you said? I kind of, I kind of cracked up a little bit for me. Um, I think I said that I learned a lot that people value what they think about things and what they value, what are they, their perspectives. So how could you make your story valuable to their perspectives? That's a really, that's a really good question. I really like that question. So, um, when we talk about like where to start a conversation with people, it's really easy for us to like, feel like, all right, I know something about climate and I'm going to like hit them with the facts and I'm going to tell them how it is. And, um, you know, it's like when your mom told you that you have to eat broccoli, you know, you're like, nope, I'm not going to eat the broccoli. Um, at least that's what I did. Um, and, uh, and mom was right. I should eat the broccoli. Um, so instead, in terms of how you utilize that story, and I kind of brushed over this, I guess, but one of the most powerful tools that we can utilize our story for is actually creating common ground with others. So, you know, I love this place. Here's why. Oh, you love this place too? Cool. Have you noticed these changes that are taking place? Oh, yeah, me too. Oh, like, should we do something about that? Here we go. And by creating that common ground, by creating that common kind of vernacular and language, we're able to really connect with communities. And that's something that gets, gets harder and harder the further away somebody else's community is from your own. But to be totally honest, like looking at like how we connect with the world around us is like is such a powerful tool for driving that change. Does that, does that help? Does that answer your question? Cool. Thank I, you. I want to just add one thing on that because Inya plays golf and golf is in nature and golf, uh, the, you know, there are a lot of aspects to golf that are under threat and the golf world can also do better in terms of, you know, resource usage, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that's actually a powerful position for her to be in. Oh yeah, I totally, totally agree. Um, and at Protect Our Winners, we end up working with ski areas a lot and it's kind of similar. It's like these, these huge industries that are being very affected by climate and don't really know what to do about it and don't know how to talk about it. And it's like, how can you help them build that narrative is really powerful. All right, so uh, Ulisse, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna say your name wrong. How do you say your name, Ulisse? Shay. Ulisse, Ulisse, Ulisse Shay? Just Shay, Shay, you're up. Oh, Shay, sorry, sorry, okay, sweet, Shay. Sorry, your hand. That's all right. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation, Graham. It was good. Um, can you can you give some examples of success stories of imperfect advocacy that is at our level? You know, not the Greta. You know, Greta, her advocacy maybe wasn't imperfect because she took a boat across, you know, the Atlantic, right? But for for everybody else who takes up this role, two parts. Can you, yeah, give an example of success story or or just explain how we can measure our our impact going down this route? Uh, okay, two great questions. Um, and I'll start with success stories. So I think that it's really interesting because 
when we look at Greta, like Greta is badass, of course. Um, what Greta is doing is totally inaccessible to most people. Most people cannot do what she's doing because we have jobs, we have families, we have other things that we're doing other than just like being able to, you know, be a young person pouring our lives into this. Um, Greta is, I mean, Greta is super important, but the thing that each of you represent are folks who are balancing being a climate advocate against the rest of your lives. And that's a really powerful example to set um, because, you know, for most, for your average person, um, you know, they don't have that much time to put towards thinking about advocacy or policy. And it turns into something where maybe they have like 10 or 20 hours a year to put towards this. And each of you are in the same boat. Like you all have a lot going on in your lives. This is something that you're going to build in in a way that, you know, your is like needs to be sustainable when set up against everything else that you're doing, particularly as athletes. I mean, being an athlete takes a lot of time and energy. So that means that you can be a really strong example of how to build this into the rest of your lives. And I think that when we look at the kind of conversation around climate, it's there's oftentimes been this kind of exclusivity where it's like you can't talk if you can't talk really like clearly about the difference between cap and invest and cap and trade or parts per million or whatever, then like, then you're kind of like considered like, oh, well, they don't really know what they're talking about. Um, and that's a huge problem because we need more people in this conversation. We need more people like indexing really highly on climate as like a reason that they're voting and what they're voting for. And, and so you can serve as an example for that for the community around you that like being a climate advocate does not need to be everything that you do, but it probably should be part of what you do, even if, even if you only have a little bit of time to put towards it. And so when we talk about that kind of like imperfect advocacy, that's really, I think, I think uh, that's, that's really important, an important component. And I think that when we look at a lot of the athletes I work with at POW, you know, there are people who don't really have that much time to put into it. They're, they're like, they're like all of us, like they're pouring their lives and souls into different, different sports, but then subsequently they're able to drive a lot of change. They're able to really bring a lot of folks into the conversation and we're able to really distill that down to simple actions like voting or calling your reps and things that don't take that much time. And, and, that, and so we're turning all these folks at POW, just like I think Lou is with you right now, turning you into trusted messengers on climate so that you can really make that more accessible. And then when we look at, um, I guess, is it against you the first part of your question? Kind of, sorry, I'm kind of rambling. It's been a long day. Um, but um, when we're looking at um, success stories, you know, the passage of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, that which was just a few weeks ago, is a really big deal. Because when we look at how we drive systemic change, like the main way that I'm focused on is through policy. And that's something that I think in like most countries around the world, there's some form of kind of political advocacy that you can engage with. Um, it's not true everywhere, but it's true a lot of places. And I think most of the places that are represented here. And, um, and so when we look at, you know, our ability to drive change through political advocacy, um, the passage of that bill is a really big deal. It's something we've been working on for a long time time. And to be totally frank, when it like looked like it wasn't going to pass um, about a month before it, it actually did finally go through, it was like this moment of like, oh my God, like this whole pathway is not going to work. I have to like totally pivot everything I'm doing. And, um, and then it ended up, we ended up being able to fight the thing through and we passed like the largest climate legislation that I think has ever been passed before. And it's like pretty, pretty cool. And so that's, so that really proves to me as like a clear success story that like, we can do this. And I will tell you right now that like, wow, it, you know, there are a lot of people working on the IRA. There are a lot of people from a lot of different communities, a lot of different organizations. Um, there are some kind of indicators that like the athlete voices that we had involved, like really made a difference. Um, and we, we managed to like really kind of show up at some key moments and it was really proof of concept that as athletes, we can be trusted messengers around the climate conversation. We can bring more people into this conversation and subsequently drive change. And um, 
and I also wanted to say, and some of the some of those on the call now are, and maybe everybody, but I just want to make sure. Um, Eco athletes also took part in uh, in building up support in in our own way for the Inflation Reduction Act amongst our American champions um, or U.S. champions. Uh, we signed a letter that went to uh, Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, before the key senator in all of this mansion said no before he said yes. The letter got, because we're at, not me, I'm the non-athlete here, um, because y'all are athletes. What's really interesting is there, and maybe uh, Graham, you know this, there was a group, I think it's called the Climate Collaborative, and there are a thousand companies that signed a letter to Schumer thousand companies from the U.S., small ones, uh, tiny ones, one-person shops all the way up to Adidas, signed this letter to Schumer. We collaborated with them, and we our letter was kind of similar to theirs. But because we have athletes, when we put out the press release, BBC Sport Today, which has six million listeners worldwide, including a million and a half-ish in the U.S., uh, interviewed Brent Suter, our uh, one of our champions from uh, who pitches for the Milwaukee Brewers. He's got a game tonight, so he couldn't be on. Um, and that was huge and so huge that roll call, which is a big, it's th their circulation isn't huge, but it's all this inside DC staffers, politicos, members of Congress read it. They pushed it out on our, on their social. So I think just to amplify what you were saying, uh, Graham, and then um, so eco athletes uh, also, you know, uh, had a role. I also want to introduce um, uh, Britt Carmen. Uh, Britt has been with us since the beginning as our first digital uh, uh, digital strategist. And uh, Brittany, do you want to say a couple words of, of introduction? Because I think she is in the political realm. Um, has been in it, so I'll I'll hand it over to Brittany for a sec. Hi everyone, I'm Brett. Um, I, as as Lou Lou said, I uh, help um, with the Eco Athletes team uh, back when it first uh, launched. Um, I am based in Washington D.C. and have um, predominantly had most of my career on the Hill or in the um, Biden administration, but I'm now. Um, recently on the Natural Resources Defense Council's um, Clean Vehicles and Fuels team and doing a lot with um, the IRA implementation as well as uh, regulatory policies for vehicle emissions. So that's what I do. Um, so happy good. to join you all. And, and great to see you. Um, any other, because I think there might have been another question, discussion. I have one. Uh, Inya, back to you in yeah. Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, so I was at a workshop with the British, uh, kind of the same community, and we were speaking about um, kind of like how to talk to public and fans and how to engage fans and how to, and I wanted to ask how can we be active and do the activism part, um, but not have negative tone of talking because if you read the newspapers um, and social media there's a lot of negative um, sound to the climate change so it is uh, very it makes you anxious it makes you afraid um, it just brings out a lot of negative emotions how can we not do that yeah, that's a really good question and um I'll kind of start with a kind of broader concept that I that's been really helpful for me and then and then kind of get down to brass tacks on like how. Um, so as we look at um, the energy energy expenditure required to be negative versus positive um, or how to like how much energy it takes to like tear something down than to build something up and create something new, it takes a lot more energy to to be positive be progressive to build something new. Um, and I mean, it's like from the athletic perspective, it takes a lot, a lot more effort to get fit than it does to get unfit. Um, 
And, uh, and so when we think about, you know, the amount, like the amount of time that an individual or an organization has to be negative, to kind of cast shade on things. If you're, if you're, if you're operating in the, in the negative kind of dismantling space, you know, if you're being a troll or if you're like, you know, kind of picking apart those around you, it's, you know, it's something that you have, you have a lot more time to, to like broadcast those opinions. You've got a lot more time and energy to spend on sharing that on Twitter or CNN or BBC or whatever. Um, whereas if you are in the trenches doing the work to move things forward in a progressive progressive direction with a growth mindset, it takes a lot more time and energy. And that oftentimes means that those people are communicating less because they are doing the work. And, and so that's always like kind of when I look at the world around me and I look at like how many people are being really negative about climate um, or social equity issues or whatever else, kind of have to remember like the people who are like in the trenches doing the work, like, like are being pretty quiet because they're doing that work. Whereas um, the people who aren't and are, you know, out there kind of broadcasting how, oh, this is, this isn't right. Oh, this is, you know, oh my God, we're just not going to make it. Oh my God. Oh my God. Blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it's like, they can be pretty, they can be pretty noisy. And so that's kind of something just to like take with you as you kind of look at the world around you and look at how people are responding to what you're doing. And, um, and you'll find that, you know, if you look for it, there are, you will find people. And I think the people are here in this room. This is why programs like this at Ego Athletes are so powerful is because we can build community around that positive work and we can be supportive of each other and the work that we're doing. And that kind of brings me to like how we can communicate on climate in a positive way. And I think that it can be pretty simple. I think we just need to communicate that we can do this, that we can take this on, that this is something that we are capable of. And, and, it, and that's true. I mean, we have the technology, we're building the political will, we're building the social will, we're moving in the right direction. Do we need to move faster than we are right now? Yes. Are we accelerating in the work that we're doing? Absolutely. Do we need to like continue building that flywheel forwards and like move forward with more positivity? Like, yeah, can we do it? Hell yeah, we can do it. And like, can you be part of like ensuring that we do it? Like, yeah, we can, we have the potential, but then like actually doing the thing is a whole other, you know, whole different whatever, can, of, can of beans or whatever. Um, and like, that's, that's what we're here for is motivating people to vote, motivating people to call their representatives or call, you know, their government officials showing up at, city council meetings, showing up at places where we can drive change, asking the organizations that we work with, how can you do better? And because you're, because you're there saying, we can do this, so let's be part of it. And, uh, and just taking on that positive framing of not only how do we move, like how do we engage because we can do this and we should do this, and then how can we bring everybody along? And I really do think that when we look at climate, when we look at like climate on its own, it's something that is really, is really, is, you know, possible. But when we start adding the social equity conversation to climate, we start looking at the nexus between those two things and how we can push them forward together. That's really how we make the world a better place. And I think it makes all of that work a lot easier. So it just kind of comes down to, yes, we can, yes, we can do this and we are capable of this. And like, let's, let's do the thing. And that's why you as athletes, folks who are performance-based individuals who are good at kicking ass and doing things are such great folks to be doing this work. Yeah. I, I I've heard that. Yes, we can thing before. I, I can't, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, it has a ring to it. Um, it does. Also, <laughs> also um, and some of you have heard me talk of this book, but I'm going to mention it again. And we have, let's see, one, two, three Canadians on this call. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a book uh, from a great Canadian uh, climate scientist, uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who uh, is, is also, to me, the best climate communicator I've ever heard. And her book, which I'll put in the chat, is called Saving Us. And 
um, what the reason I'm mentioning it, other than it's a tremendous book, and I think you all should read it, is that what Graham was saying that we can do this. Um, Catherine's book takes that and you know puts it on steroids, and but it's not like kumbaya and no, it's it's fact based yet it also just makes so much sense and also because i know we are uh, it's one thing to be in a conversation like this with like-minded folks but when we're by ourselves when we hear the news and it sounds so dire and impossible at times you know we can get in a i know but more human we can get in a state of, of climate anxiety or climate grief however that is a that is a mindset that is simply temporary and not necessarily fact based. It's just more inundated by news based, and that's why it's important to read Catherine's book because you can see that we are already making progress, even if it doesn't seem so. With some of the, you know, two things can be true at once that seem opposed to each other. There can be dire climate news and we can be making progress and now we have to just be making progress at a more accelerated rate and that's what we're trying to do with eco athletes to help you um and and that's what graham is doing with um protect our winters as well um so i just wanted to say that um any other any any uh, more questions or thoughts um more thoughts, I think, from me necessarily than questions. But by the I way, suppose... Radian, Radian, love your background there. That is that that is awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I took that on my honeymoon last year. Um, but yeah, thought, thoughts wise, like for me, um, reflecting back, Graham, on on what you're saying about like um, personal versus systemic change. Um, you know, as as athletes, um, you know, we do get this really cool platform whether it's like a gigantic platform that like the world's best athletes have or whether it's a bit more local if we're um you know college level or, or what have you um you know the the carbon footprint associated with that is kind of like just the the entry price the entry ticket um and so like acknowledging acknowledging that i think can take away a little bit of that sense of um hypocrisy because it's like well you know here I'm, I'm trying to use my platform for good i've just had to pay the entry ticket um and yeah you know that's a little bit of, of carbon um equivalent in the atmosphere but um you know the payoff hopefully will be much bigger than that um then yeah my own personal experience is you know i've had some people you know sort of in my community whether they're close to me or just like acquaintances thank me for for speaking out on, on things uh you know like climate change and um speaking about policy and what we should do um so, yeah, you know, you, these are people that might not necessarily get engaged or buy or listen to, like, the Greta's of the world. Um, you know, even if you've got a really small, uh, um, relatively speaking, like, crowd of people to talk to, you still have a chance to influence people that might not be otherwise influenced by other climate communicators. So we do um, feel a really important role in that sense. And then last thought is... Um, just on the Australian perspective, um, so earlier, I can't remember if it was this year or last year, we had um, our Climate Council release a report which was sort of like reflecting on how climate change is impacting sport and what sport can do. And that um, was supported by a couple of big, bigger uh, name athletes in Australia and that got a little bit of, of traction in the news. And then also we had our uh, federal elections um, earlier this year and basically there was a, a huge influx of candidates that were campaigning really strongly on climate change and, you know, athletes talking about how climate change is impacting them, um, com contributing to that uh, conversation, I think contributed to that um, electoral outcome. So now there's a real, um, yeah, a lot of political capital and a lot of will in, in our federal parliament to um, accelerate our action on climate change because Australia has traditionally been a little bit of a laggard and we even had an ex-sportsman um, go and, and win uh, Senate campaigns so um, rugby 
union, I think for people who are particularly, I guess, from Australia or New, New Zealand or England or whatnot, probably a bit more familiar with it. But um, yeah, David Pocock was a former captain of Australia and, and now he's in the parliament um, fighting for that stuff. And we also have in the lower house a, uh, a winter Olympian, Zali Stegel uh, as well. So, you know, for, for sports people talking about this stuff um, can then, and talking about policy can then also, you can be the people like writing the policy uh, there in, in the, the halls of power potentially. Awesome. And I think that is one of the great, actually, that's one of the great green sports stories of this year, to tell you the truth. Um, I know we're, I, I want to be mindful, we're up against time, um, both for Graham and for you all. Uh, I'm happy to stay on and continue uh, the conversation. But uh, Graham, if you need to hop, you know, Certainly, I'll, feel free. To... I, I should I should jump off. I've got a couple of things I got to jump into here. Uh, it's been kind of a chaotic day, but um, I will say just to kind of follow up on what you just said a second ago. Um, uh, a work on the local level is super important when we look at how things like this build. Oftentimes, they are super fo like they start local, they build, and they build till they reach the federal level. And particularly with climate, when we look at um, renewable resources, when we look at the green, like moving towards a green energy economy, um, a lot of those things are very geographically specific. You know, what is available in your area? Wind, is it solar? Is it, um, you know, the hydro, whatever? And so that, that local work is ultra important. And, uh, and the other thing is, um, if any of you want to run for office, just do it. Um, and I can actually point you in some resources, point you towards some resources on that. Um, I work with another organization called Dirt Road Organizing that actually supports um, supports candidates who are looking to run on progressive platforms, particularly in rural districts. And um, yeah, rural districts. So if that's something you're interested in, get it. It's a badass thing to do, and it's a great way to drive change. And um, and I'm going to stick my email in the uh, in the chat here. Please feel free to follow up on any questions you have. And gang, I really appreciate it this evening. This has been really cool. And Graham, thank you. And I'll I'll see you for Thursdays, uh, 7.30. Wait, are you in the mountain or Pacific time? You're in Mount, you're in Pacific. I'm mountain. Oh, you're or, mountain. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm Pacific. No, I'm Pacific. in Pacific. So we'll see you at 7.30 in the morning your time on Thursday. For yeah, the, you get, you get caff, caffeinated me instead of end of the day. For the, for the uh, Europe-friendly time zone version. Um, I can only say uh, thank you so much, Graham. And uh, oh. and uh, I'm happy to stay on with any of you all who want to continue chatting. But Graham, uh, feel free to go on to your next thing. I'll jump. I'll jump off. Thank you all for being here, and thank you all for getting involved. We are all certainly into this together, and uh, together we can get this shit done. So keep it up, and let me know how I can help. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, friends. Yep. Thank, you. thank you. Bye, Graham. Awesome. Uh, or uh, that's what, what did you guys think? Is that helpful? Sounds really good. Yeah, really well done. Yeah, good energy. The, the visuals are great too. It always helps. And anybody ready to run for office? Just, no pressure. Just, oh, just speaking of, speaking of, there is um, Canadian race walker running for a local council in uh, Richmond, which I think is a suburb of Vancouver. Uh, Evan oh, Dunphy. Wow. Oh, yeah, wow. Get behind him. him. Wait a minute. This like 30 you, minutes from where I am. Do you know him? Uh, who, me or Doug? I, I, no, Ridian, I, do I you don't. know him? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've raced against him. But um, Doug, yeah, if you're keen to volunteer for him, he's um, uh, more, more than happy to uh, take people on. Yeah. Well, if you want to make an introduction, I've got a pretty extensive network for in um, like the hockey space and things like that. So I'm happy to throw some support and introduce them to anybody that might help his his campaign uh absolutely uh what's the best way for me to uh i'll, what's connect, the best I'll connect you guys i'll connect you guys uh okay. via email right afterwards um, thanks Lou. and um a couple of things uh unless anybody else want to chime in about uh your thoughts on this on on graham's talk and the and the topic All right, well, I'm going to then add a couple of things. Um, one is I, I connected to, you know, the 
impact you can have locally. And I don't necessarily mean, lo like it doesn't necessarily in my mind mean locally, geographically, like in your zip code, although that certainly could be, uh, uh, that could be the case, but meaning through your, through your networks, through your local networks, your social channels, blah, blah, blah. And I think one of the, the, uh, one of the great, one of the great things about our champions, no matter your social media following size, is that your stories are inspirational. And each one of your stories are inspirational. And you can connect the, your personal story and your journey to climate, and people are going to react to it. And I, you know, our job at Eco Athletes in large part is to help unleash that. So what we're going to be doing is launching the Close for Good campaign that several of you have helped on brainstorms. And I believe, Shay, you were involved in the very first conversation when we had Maxime Bada, the author of Unraveled. Um, the, the journey, the life and death of a garment, another excellent book. Um, well, that was in February. Now we're almost in October. That conversation plus three brainstorms with the champions has led us to a point where we now have, uh, we will be able to launch Clothes for Good as a monthly uh, campaign that'll go over, that'll be a year long one at least each month, a different uh, close for good topic will be released to you all with a hashtag and with social media content that you can easily just in two or three clicks, pop it on to Instagram, Twitter. Yes, TikTok, if you're doing that. Um, and to your channels, to your networks with whom you have influence, and we are going to track how our followers writ large respond to encouragements from you all, suggestions as to how they can make their clothes a force for good. And we think it's also going to be fun. We think it's going to be, we made it simple. That was key because we only wanted to make, we wanted to make it take a couple minutes of your time each month. And once we start getting real response and it starts to build a following, we then can take that evidence to the apparel industry, specifically the athletic apparel industry, the Nikes, the Adidas, et cetera, et cetera, of the world and say, here, look at what athletes of the athletes of the world, the eco athletes champions have built. This is, these are, look at all these people who want change. You guys are doing a good job already, but we need to move faster. How can we help you move faster? And we would invite you all, you know, to different conversations so you could be part of the conversations with the apparel companies. That's our goal. So we will be sending you in the next day or two, the, what we have as a, um, we have Two websites. One is a toolkit that's just for the champions to show you how to, you know, take the uh, social the social media tiles that we provide, add your own comments if you would like to customize it, and then to post it. And then it will direct those posts will direct your followers to a consumer website, which will be in parallel to the toolkit, and then they can interact with all of this content. So we are excited about it. Any, well, you'll see when I send it out. So this is our first big eco athletes initiative. I thank you in advance. I thank you in retrospectively for those of you who helped us uh, get to this point. And I thank all of you in advance for taking part in it. And now I'll shut up about that. Um, and anything else. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, we will, uh, you'll be hearing from us shortly about uh, Close for Good. And if you have any other questions on 
uh, this uh, on tonight's topic, you can see, certainly reach out to Graham, or you can, uh, if you want to talk more about uh, uh, political advocacy, I've done a lot of that work as well. And um, and then we'll go from there. And then Ridian and Doug, I will e introduce you to each other. And uh, thank you all for coming. And we'll see you soon. Thanks. And also welcome thank to you, the newest everybody. champions. Yes, welcome to our newest champions. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Hey, Catherine. Whoop. Bye, Catherine. <laughs>